This is Asante here from the Tech Muse Academy, and welcome back to episode 70 of the Tech Muse podcast. Uh, today, I got the privilege and pleasure of chatting with a good buddy of mine, Kevin D. Foster, uh, who is a musician, singer, songwriter, performer, uh, heavily gigged musician, making, I, I believe, most of your living uh, uh, doing this these days. Uh, Kev, welcome to the show, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Uh... Appreciate you having me on the show. I've seen a few episodes and there's some pretty uh, big names coming on here. So to have me on here, it's, it's an honor. Well, no problem. In fact, you and I have been trying to organize this for a while. We've talked about it for ages and uh, it's good to finally get you on the call here and, uh, and chat and pick your brain a little bit about what you do as a DIY musician. So these days, now you're you're... Out of, out of my group of musical peers, you're probably one of the most heavily booked uh, musicians that I know of. Uh, and that's definitely something I want to dig into a little bit with you. Um, see, one of, the, one of the benefits of having a platform like the Tech Muse podcast is I get to bring people on who I want to know what they do and how they do it. And they tell me. It's wonderful. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's a bonus. Yeah, right. So how long have you been at this now? You've been playing music all your life? Or give us a little 25 cent tour as to, you know, where you've been and, and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, I actually was quite a bit of a late bloomer. I probably didn't start playing music sort of like regularly until I was about 19 or 20. College years, I started writing my first few songs and I went to my first few open mics. And then I started in a band and we did our own thing. We were writing music as a bunch of young kids, you know, that sort of like punk rock attitude, you know, anything goes. And then I got to a point where like I was kind of getting a little bit older and I kind of needed to sort of figure my life out and pay some bills yeah uh, you know when you're a young rock star you're just you know you're buying booze and whatever other party favors you need as a rock star and uh and you're not you know paying your mortgage or you don't have a mortgage to pay so <clears throat> i got to a point where i need to pay some bills and i kind of just parted my ways with the band and started to do like a one-man show and uh and play mostly covers actually so that's that's where it ended up and then for about i'd say like for the last four years I've been touring, like you said, pretty heavily. Like, there's not many guys that I even know who, who play as many times as I do. There's a few guys um, who I will probably reference their names along the podcast because they're guys I looked up to as well. Um, and now it's the reason we couldn't get this podcast going uh, is because I'm so busy with shows, you know, four or five nights a week sometimes. So yeah, that's, that's where we're at. That's awesome. And that, so, so the first question that pops into my mind is, is with all of these dates, and I know it's not like you're playing, you know, the the five bars in your city every weekend or whatever. It's like you you dra you travel quite a bit. You have quite a quite a wide um, uh, uh, reach as far as where you're booking your gigs. How does that all work out in terms of? you know, uh, expense versus return on your investment, you know, wear and tear on your vehicle, gas and mileage and all these things. I'm not sure if you find yourself in situations where you need to also get accommodations because you've, you know, you've gone a little too far out. Uh, give us a little insight into that. How does that work as far as the numbers go? Yeah. So, I mean, everybody's price is going to be different based on what your quality of work is worth. Worth. I mean, after four years of doing it so often, like, you know, my price has gone up quite a bit over the years. I started for quite a bit less and couldn't go as far. Um, but generally, I will go about one hour's distance from where I am, sometimes a little bit further. Beyond that, you need to start, I need to start to charge a little extra on top of my flat rate. And that would be mostly for private corporate events or weddings or things like that. Beyond that, I wouldn't go to a bar in Ottawa, Ontario from the Toronto area. Uh, it's just too far and not feasible unless there was some sort of crazy event going on where they were going to cover all that. So, Right. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, another question I have for you, because uh, for, for those people listening, you may or may not recall that I also uh, am a, a gigging musician with my lovely lady, Carol. We call ourselves just simply Des and Carol. And we're in the process now of, you know, booking gigs and whatnot. We've been at it for a couple of years and so, you know, still sort of learning the ropes. But one of the questions that I guess I would have for you is, as you've been doing it longer, um, how, how is it that you've managed to negotiate higher rates for your services? Now, you, now, first of all, I should let everyone know that you predominantly play as a one man band. So there aren't too many mouths to feed. If you're in a four or five piece band, you know, you've got four or five people that need to pay the bills, right? So, so you've got to charge more as a one man band. You can get away with playing a hundred dollar gig as long as it's not too far away. But how have you managed to negotiate higher rates with these venue owners and bar owners? Well, most times beyond like 
I'm a little hoarse today. I played three or four shows in a row, actually, so I'm a little worn out. <laughs> but I, I've been, I've been told, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to do a humble brag or anything, but I've been told I have a really good voice, and you know, I have a good product. And once you start to hear that enough, and everybody, all the servers at the bar say, you know, you're one of the best guys who's who's played here. You know, you know, you start to realize, okay, well, if, you know, if my product is is here and everybody else's product is here, then, you know, why am I not getting paid more? And on top of that, I provide a product, like you said, that is probably one of the most unique products around here. I do have, like, a really interesting foot drum now. I used to have a suitcase and a few things, and a lot of guys have cajones or kick drums or stomp boxes or things like that. But now, I mean, I've even stepped it up a little bit further so I can ask for a little bit more because I'm providing, you know, a filet mignon. You mm-hmm. can go get yourself a cheeseburger for a buck sixty nine, or you can get yourself a steak for twenty five dollars. Yeah. So, and it's like, what do you want? And you can go, you know, there are different bars. Some bars will pay for a dollar sixty nine burger. Other bars want to pay for a steak. You understand what I'm saying? Right? I do. Everybody understands the analogy. So, if if you can just make yourself a steak then you can charge what a stake is worth. Yeah. And I think that's the bottom line in negotiation. Um, when it's close, I'm still very supportive of my parents and grandparents since I started to make some money. Of course, before when I was in the band just doing the rock star thing, you know, it was kind of like, okay, whatever. But now my parents are, are like happy to support me. They're supportive and helping me find gigs. They're always talking to me about different places to go and and all that sort of thing. So that really helps when they come out for dinner at the bar that I'm playing at and the bar makes an extra hundred bucks because there's a couple extra people there. They really appreciate that. So as much as I try not to be a promoter, I do do very basic promotion and I act like I'm a a teammate to that bar. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that's very valuable to them is like not only am I – providing music but i'm always saying hey hopefully you're tipping those waitresses you know i'm always saying oh i recommend the whatever beer on tap i really recommend the blt sandwich or whatever it is and i'm helping to sell their bar why because i'm an employee i'm a subcontractor there and if they do well i do well yeah and it's a give take relationship so if you look at it that way and you're a proper businessman you'll do just fine yeah there's a couple of points there like and I'm, and it's refreshing to hear you speak this way because a lot of times people forget about the fact that that when you and a bar decide to do business together, that that's exactly what it is. It's a business relationship, you know. Um, and and I think that I think people miss that point a lot. And and everyone I hear a lot in the sort of local music scene about you know you know venue bashing and oh this person tried to jip us and this, or, or why don't people pay more and yada yada yada. And at the end of the day, it's a business relationship. You know, you're you're providing a, a, a certain degree of value to the bar owner. They're providing Providing value in return, most most of the time in the in the form of dollars and cents, and maybe a you know a free drink and a bite to eat or whatnot. But uh, but it's a value exchange, and it's true, like you say, that you do have to make sure that you demonstrate the value that you are providing to the venue owner above and beyond just the quality of your music and your performance. That's interesting. And the other thing I'll say is you definitely got some steak going on. I've seen you play a number of times <laughs> and you are, you are good at what you do. Uh, I noticed recently you got this, uh, the, uh, the farmer foot drum set. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So that's another business endeavor as a musician. Like I I was playing with, like I had a kick drum, like a full 24 inch by 24 inch kick drum with a full hi hat. I was carrying all this around with a PA and I was, you know, too foreign on those things. And then I found this site online that, that makes one man band instruments or instruments for people who want to do percussion while they're playing whatever banjo or guitar or anything. Um, and they have these little things called the downbeat pedals. So I, I ordered two of them online and I said, guys, I play literally hundreds of shows a year, like almost, oh, almost 200 shows a year, which is, you know, every th- two out of every three days. Yeah. Excuse me. And, um, they said, you know what, if you're putting that much time in then a lot of people are going to see these little instruments. And so I, I bought them paid full price and I started to do promotion and and really like I was on their team you know once again this is a business relationship you guys are going to help me out with these pedals and they gave me their artist discount and I Instagrammed it I Twittered it I Facebooked it everyone at the show I have their business cards I stuck their stickers on all my cases 
and I did as much promotion for them as I can. And once again, this is a give, give and take relationship. So after a year of touring with the little downbeat pedals that I purchased, um, I decided and I made enough money that I decided I was going to invest in this flagship product called the foot drum. And uh, they have various options. I got the nine pedal version. So mm. it's a nine pedal drum that sits in a small, you know, it's about a two by three box with a tom as the kit drum that kind of folds up. And if you go to footdrums.com, uh, you can just basically click on the website and check out what it looks like. So you order one of these and they're custom made for you and they come to you. And now, um, I can actually play like basically full drum beats, mostly single hit patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, like the old leave on helm swamp beat, that's like boots and cats and boots and cats. Yeah. Very, you know, that's a very common one I can do. And I've got a few beats for six, eight, the very common six, eight patterns. Boom, boom, chick, cat, chick, cat, boom, boom, chick catch you know those six eight patterns so you learn those patterns that are you, you do the 80 20 with this you know right you take 80 percent of the drum beat and throw it away and whatever the 20 percent is you can pull off with just your feet so that's so awesome. that's yeah so i just got that and that kind of like once again it, it raised the level like i actually sound almost like a full band at this point um you know before i was two forward a little bit of beats but now i can keep a beat that is danceable right um, so it really helps with the negotiation again, right? One hundred percent. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You've added you've added an additional layer of value to what it is that you're bringing to the table, and it's interesting to see because you do this all without help. Like it's just you lugging the gear, setting the gear up, tearing the gear down, playing all the music, all of the parts, including drums, while you're strumming and humming. Uh, and yeah. and it's it's really actually quite impressive. Do you have anywhere online um, where people like on a YouTube uh, channel where people can see this in action? Do you got anything out there yet? Yeah. So I haven't quite gotten like a full produced video together yet because i'm still i only got it at the end of april and uh so i've had it for a few months and i'd really like to be a little bit better before i throw it out there but there are some small clips on my instagram if you just go to at kev d foster that's all my you know all my social so at kev d foster on instagram if you scroll down a little bit there's a few little videos and some photos of the drum of me sort of playing and strumming um but other than that, I haven't quite got there yet. I do have a photo shoot coming up with it for, you know, a, with a professional guy to take some photos and maybe a, a quick little video. So we'll get that out there. But nice. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. OK, so let's talk about booking gigs. How does this work in, in your uh, in your business? Do you do you like what sort of level of organization do you have? Do you, uh, you know, do you got a spreadsheet? Do you do, you do anything like that? You got this no. contact database, anything like that? Any tools you use? Yeah, I just I always have my iPhone within arm's reach like everybody does. Right. And, you know, if you're using the calendar or any calendar, a Google calendar of some sort, and it's on the cloud, and you pick up your phone and you're at the venue and you finish your gig, it's like, hey, Johnny, let's set up another date. And you open the calendar right there and you put it in. Yeah. And you put make sure you put it on the right date. You put the time. You put the location. You put how much you negotiated in mm. the notes mm -hmm. every time every single time because you don't want to get there and go i forget what he said and then you're asking for more you write it down and it's like this is what we talked about it's in my calendar notes period right okay um now after four years of being organized but i do only use an iphone or mm. an ipad or my computer if i'm at home sending emails out and those calendars sync across the board i have one calendar that's you know on, on apple calendars you can color them one is called music Right. And everything goes into that purple calendar is music. So I can turn on music and I'll see all the gigs and I can turn them off and I'll just see all my personal stuff or my work stuff and other stuff like that. Um, and that's pretty much all I use. So you've um, got you've got momentum now. What about in the beginning or what about even now when you're approaching a new venue who, who doesn't have any relationship with you and, and hasn't necessarily heard you? What's that? Right. How do you how does your approach change there? A couple things I did at the beginning was I called every single bar within like an hour radius of my house and just asked if they had live music. And if they didn't, I'd ask if they'd be interested in having some live music. I'm a local guy. I'm from, from around. I'd love to come play. Um, I always play top 40 rock and, and classic rock and stuff that like, I mean, a lot of people don't like to do that. And I don't either. I'm tired of it too. But the Beatles, the Eagles, CCR, yeah. you know, all that stuff that people want to sing along to the Oasis and the Pearl Jam now because the nineties are big for those older crowd. Yeah. Um, so I play all of that stuff. Um, I've gotten 
so I have a list of songs that I send them and say, listen, I play all these songs that your patrons are going to know and love. Um, you know, I, I have reference letters. So in the first few bars I played it, I said to the manager, like, hey, you liked what I did tonight? Would you mind writing me four or five sentences on a letterhead from your bar? So it says Johnny's Bar Letterhead. You know, Kevin Kim performed for us. He was on time. He didn't drink an ounce of booze. He played for longer sets than everybody else. He only stopped to go to the washroom to get more water. Hmm. And he didn't, you know, he, had, he used none of his bar tab. And he, he was out of here. He didn't leave a mess. And and that was it. They write a little thing. And I'd have four or five reference letters and I'd send them out. And it would people might ask me to see a YouTube video of me. And that would be it. Right. Oftentimes it wouldn't even be a YouTube video. It would be like, okay, well, this guy obviously knows what he's doing. Fake it before you make it. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it was like, okay, now the calls come in. Like my phone rings twice a week with people I've never heard of for a private party, a wedding, a corporate event or another bar. It just rings now. Yeah. That's that's, excellent. Yeah. yeah. You've got, you've got the momentum and, uh, and it's, and obviously that should be acknowledged, but yeah, I I believe a lot of people that listen to this show um, are in a position where, uh, where they're just getting out. And the other thing is, is that a lot of people are, they're in bands or, or duos or even just solo artists that are really interested in performing their own material. And that's, in my opinion, that's it's almost like a second. It's it's a different job, sort of th- sort of thing, right? Yeah. There's yeah, I the, separate the two. Yeah, there's the uh, the idea of building an audience around your art as a musician, and then there's the idea of providing a valuable service to a, a, a potential business partner, even if it's a temporary business arrangement. Um, can you speak on that a little bit and how you juggle that? Yeah. So often, you know, I've had an extremely difficult time with this lately because. After four years and hundreds and hundreds of shows, it gets tiring to play the Beatles every single night. Mm. Sometimes, like yesterday, I had two gigs in a day, and like I was confusing what songs I had played already. Right. You know what I mean? Like I was like, did I play this one at this venue yet? You know? <laughs> and it's just like I've I've done them so many times. I'm actually better at other people's songs than I am at my own songs. Mm. So recently, that's been a real struggle for me, and I've been trying to sort of slowly tip the scales. But what I do, what I've promise myself is i will have one show every month that i don't care if i lose money i will drive somewhere to play all of my own stuff no one tells me what to pay play i don't expect to make money Mm. if i make a little money that's awesome and i'm just getting a few cds pressed now and if i sell a few cds that's awesome but that's more for me you know and that's that's to feed the artist in me and not, you know, actually feed me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> a distinction <It's>, there. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm trying to have the two of them and trying to find a little bit of balance between that. So it is it is difficult. And tons of guys who are great musicians and could do what I do kind of refuse to do that. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get it. Everybody is different. And it's, sometimes it's soul crushing. Yeah. <laughs> it can be, it can be diff- I've played. I literally played two Wednesdays ago. I played at... Um, a franchise bar in Ontario, Canada here. And I played on the patio on a Wednesday evening and I literally played for two hours to not a soul. Not one person was there. It was a little, <laughs> chi- it was a little chilly. It was their first time doing live music. I played no matter what. I didn't stop playing. I did exactly what I was, what was required of me. I collected my paycheck and I went home. You know, yeah. that was it. Yeah. I think and I saw was, your post on Facebook about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I played for nobody, and that's it. You know what? I collected my check and I went home, and that's fine. And and sometimes that's crushing. And then you'll have nights where, like, you know, the last couple nights, like the last two shows I played, were both packed, and both lots of people cheering. Even though I wasn't playing my own stuff, it was still sort of feeding the artist within me, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. So I, I mean, there is a balance to be found there. I haven't quite reached that yet. Right. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm on the, you know, people would kill to be in my position. And sometimes I'm kind of like, ah, damn, you know, I kind of like to be playing my own stuff. But yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to have a chat with you on the on the podcast is because you're a really great example of someone who's decided I'm a musician. So I'm going to pay my bills by being a musician. And a lot of times, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation you'll hear around online and offline, of course, about, you know, you can't make money the whole starving artist thing and all of that. And, and I'm really passionate about letting people 
know that, you know, if you would rather strum your guitar than flip a hamburger, then there are ways that you can do that, you know, and, and there are ways that you can also pursue your own art as an artist and, uh, and still get bills paid by doing things that are within your field of interest. And Carol and I do it. We're gigging a lot now. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the ways in which we've been acquiring uh, new venues to play at is by doing our Periscope invasions. I don't know if you've seen any of those uh, that we've posted, but uh, we live stream on Periscope and on Busker, which is an awesome uh, app. And I haven't seen you on either of those platforms, so we'll have to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, we'll live stream on Periscope, and so we do these invasions where we'll just grab an acoustic, a, a, a ukulele, and maybe a cajon, and we'll just walk into a place in the middle of the day, and we'll say, hey, do you guys mind if we just set up and stream uh, to our followers a a couple of songs and, and entertain you know your patrons for you know just five or ten minutes and if they if they let us they hire us every single time <laughs> right? uh, because they right. get a, they get an opportunity to see us and hear us right there for free uh, there's no edits no nothing no video editing and going on nothing we get a chance to put on a live event both for the people in the venue and for our online followers who subscribe to us on periscope and uh, and Every single time we've done it, we've also gotten gigs out of it. So that's just something I just wanted to throw on the table there in addition yeah. to the this, this techniques that you've mentioned. And, uh, and, um, and, well, maybe you've tried that sometime. But the yeah. other thing I wanted to mention is, or to ask you is, have you thought about or had any experience with house concerts? Uh, I have, actually. I've done a few of them. And uh, they seem to, if you, if you have a... Uh, a good venue that's been uh, how do I say this that has a name behind it that will get a, a lot of people out f for you along with your own fans you can make as much money as you would doing covers for four hours at a bar one night mm. um, so I, I've done places where I play one hour of original music and I'll take home a good chunk of cash right. and I'll also take home 12 new fans mm. you know real fans real Kevin Foster fans not Campfire Kev that's right. what I kind of, you know, Campfire Kev is the cover guy who goes around, sits around the campfire and goes, oh, baby, want to be the one that sees. That's Campfire Kev. Yeah. And then Kevin Foster is me, the artist. So when you do play those, you're, you know, people are there to see you and, and to hear your music and you can make some cash. I think it's a great, I'm trying to do one of those a month. Right. That's kind of my thing, right? Remember, I, I, that's my thing. Like my promise to myself this year was like, don't do all covers every weekend, you know, take one show every month and do it for yourself. And those kind of house concerts are the ones that I'm sort of honing in on for that. And and how are you finding hosts for the house concerts? Are you just sort of word of mouth referrals or? Usually word of mouth, friend to friend. Um, there is a website called acousticroof.ca. Mm. Unfortunately, you call most of those places and they're like booked two years in advance. Right. They usually only do one show a month or one every few months because they're inviting their neighbors from neighboring farms or small communities who come for wine and cheese and they pay 20 or $25 to come in and they usually put you up for the night and so on and so forth and feed mm. you a breakfast and head you out in the morning. But uh, I haven't unfortunately had a chance to get into those. I've wanted to really badly and I've contacted a few that just didn't work out because they're so far booked in advance. But right. uh, I think it's acousticroof.ca. I'm not 100% sure. It might be .com, but it is a Canadian website. So that uh, a lot of East Coast, uh, some Ontario, um, mostly East Coast and Ontario. But uh, I find also, Des, that we live in the poorest province for live music performance. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, maybe so. <laughs> if, yeah, like I find that like I've talked to a lot of musicians in other provinces. I mean, I'm not sure, so sure about out west, but out east, especially in the maritime provinces, um, it's more pubs than clubs. And they want wooden instruments. You right. know, they want the they want the kitchen jam parties. They want the mandolin, the guitar, the, the wooden foot drum. Yeah. You know, they want somebody banging on that suitcase or whatever. And uh, there's a Celtic sort of Irish, uh, I don't know how to say it, other than maritime feel, Canadian yeah. maritime feel out there. And I, I believe that they value music a little higher. Mm. And I've been told many times that it's 
almost double the, the value here as it would be here in Ontario, the greater Toronto area and such. Mm, maybe time for a little road trip, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> I think so. Well, you know what? I had a few friends. Uh, I'll just give them a quick shout out. Sly Violet. Uh, they did a very successful East Coast tour. Uh, they drove out there and back, and it, I think it was four weeks or so, and they came back with uh, a couple thousand dollars in profit. Wow. A- after all expenses. So wow. they came home. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's not hard. That's not easy to do. Um, you know, Violet booked the whole thing herself and uh, negotiated place differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they and she had an Excel sheet for that for the expenses and the because it's a big tour. Sure. I mean, what I'm do, what I'm doing is going to a venue and then back home every night. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they went on a full loop for six or eight weeks. I don't really do that very often. I'd like to, and that might be in the future. Mm-hmm. But that takes a lot more. Uh, what's going out, what's coming in, travel time. Sure. It's a lot more organization. Um, don't get me wrong, what I do is a lot of organization as well, but uh, it seems to be a little bit more, um, you know, I can sit down on my computer every once in a while and do things and, and fill up the calendar, whereas that is like weeks of work on end every day, right. calling and calling to get everything lined up in perfect succession in the, in the route you need to take right yeah and probably still have things that you know fall through the cracks as you start to get into it 100 <laughs> percent. more often than not i imagine <laughs> so just yeah. to, just to wrap up the house concert thing um what's your revenue model when it comes to house concerts do you charge the host or do you just sell cds or what do you do in a typical house concert situation the house concerts uh that i've been at um actually one is coming up at the end of june here um and it is they have a minimum donation mm. Uh, for everyone who comes to the concert and generally that goes to the artist right um sometimes uh you know i've played one where there we had a videographer and uh sometimes in the city of toronto the places are doing it to help pay their rent at their condo at, or at their loft right um so sometimes the plate actually does keep a little bit of that door um to help keep the concerts going on right Mm -hmm. i mean to help keep that place alive and you know to clean up after and so on and so forth um you know these venues aren't making any money selling booze or anything right so they if they you know they can't be you know they have a space that they're offering for us i really appreciate and i don't mind if they take some of that that's totally okay for me um but generally it's the door and of course merch sales so what i find is you're going to get you know a good chunk from the door and then everybody who's there is usually invested in your music enough that they're going to purchase your music and if they don't buy a cd from you you could probably expect that they will go and make a download purchase Mm. um you know or give you a a follow on on some of those ever important social networks certainly um so I, I think that the model is both. It's, it's you're going to get from the door. People are paying to get in to see you. And you're going to sell your CDs or your, your merchandise to them and probably make a, a decent chunk, almost 50-50, I would think. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, there's a woman named Shannon Curtis um, who wrote a book called No Booker, No Bartender, No Bouncer. Have you read it? Do you, are you familiar I, with Shannon? I, I'm very I'm very familiar, and I've read the Coles notes on it, but I have not read the full book. Okay. I but have I yet to read it. I just purchased it uh, um, on the iPad. Um, I haven't got into reading it yet. To be honest, most of the time I consume books via audio. So for me to yep. sit down and actually move my eyes from left to right over and over again is not something I'm very, I'm very comfortable with. I normally get tired and fall asleep, but I will read this one because I'm interested. But uh, for those people listening, uh, I recommend you check her out. In fact, she was on an episode of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. Don't remember which episode it was, but if you just search uh, for Shannon Curtis, you'll find a really, really cool interview with her. And she breaks down the reason why she does exclusively house concerts. And I got some really neat uh, food for thought from that. And now we've been experimenting with it a bit ourselves. Uh, And uh, when we do house concerts, it's like you say, well, in in fact, we haven't done one where they've charged a minimum donation. Um, We've done them where, where we play entirely free. And then we we ask for donations and support and we sell our merchandise and we've walked away with decent cash, especially when you compare it to the dollar per hour when you play a four hour night at a pub where people aren't necessarily there to hear you. They're there to drink and socialize. And if they happen to like what you're playing, that's an added bonus, you know, yeah, uh, I'm yeah. sure you can relate to that. But when oh, you yeah. have a captive audience of 15 or 20 people sitting down in front of you and, and, you know, maybe sipping on a beverage and watching and listening to you, that's an entirely different experience. Oh. And that's, that's worth something alongside 
aside whatever money comes in, you know, from the night, as far as I'm concerned. And you I also agree. hit the nail on the head that you end up with real genuine fans out of it. You get their names on uh, their email addresses into your email list and you stay in touch with them and they're going to they're going to be eager to hear from you and they're going to be eager to know when you've got something else for them to check out. And that is powerful in itself. So a question for you, Dad, since mm-hmm. you flipped, it, the, flipped the script. Um, do you, are, are, like you're doing the Periscope takeover and you're kind of inviting yourself, are you finding people and saying, hey, why don't I throw a house concert for you? Or you're having a birthday party, you're having a party, are you seeking those out? Or are they venues that put on house concerts? No, it's, of- it's us seeking them out. In fact, we haven't gotten in touch with anyone. Uh, uh, in fact, I've got two contacts that I have yet to reach out to um, that actually are set up and do house concerts on a regular basis. For us, it's just been um, reaching out to people we've done we've done one that you know friends and family type of thing right and our criteria is um, we will play 100% for free this is our method um, you know feel free anyone who's listening to experiment but we play 100% for free and we only ask for two things in return uh, one that there's at least 15 you know, adults in attendance, people who are capable of buying something, you know, so not 15, six year olds, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and then the only other thing we ask for is that the host provides a comfortable place for people to gather and watch us play. Anything above and beyond that is entirely up to the host. If they want to serve finger foods or whatnot, that's entirely up to them. They're basically hosting a social and we're coming to provide the entertainment for free. And then we will, uh, you know, we'll have our donation uh, bucket out front and we'll incorporate it into our, sh- our spiel, you know, you know, if, if, cause I play in a duo, of course, with Carol and she's a fantastic singer. So when we get to the end of a tune, hit that last chord and I wipe the sweat from my brow and I point at her and I say, you know, somebody tip this woman, you know, these kinds of things so we incorporate it into our performance and then we have of course our merchandise for sale and uh and dollars per hour it's it's wonderful we're in fact we're trying our hardest to get more and more of these types of events because they're a lot more enjoyable to to be at and to perform and uh they're they're oftentimes more lucrative and you end up with a fan base you're developing your fan base and those are all powerful things from the artist side you know as opposed to the like you said campfire kev thing (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly so i think in my opinion house concerts are a great way to begin to make that transition into still getting paid while playing music but also playing your music and being expressive as who you are as an artist and that's something we're definitely working towards that's for sure something just popped into mind while you're saying that is like i'm often at places uh, parties, social events where they're like, oh, hey, man, here's a guitar. Why don't you grab your guitar and play us a few songs? And I'm like, dude, like, yeah, I do not want to play my guitar right now. But yeah. I'm thinking that that's a huge opportunity for me to say, how about we set a date two months from now. Mm-hmm. I'll come back here with my guitar and we'll do an actual night of me singing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not playing Oasis. I will not play Wonderwall, no. <laughs> but I will come and play my guitar for you and we'll make an intimate setting. So that seems like, because I was also watching an interview with Brandon, uh, is it Brandon Boyd from uh, Incubus? Lead singer oh, okay. Incubus? Right. Okay. So the Grammys interviewed him and he was saying like, the last thing he ever wants to do is play a song when he's not playing, but when he's playing, that's what he's there to do. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the same thing. And then like, maybe you can turn that, that awkward situation where like, I'm not really here to play right now and say, okay, let's maybe make this into a concert. And that seems like just kind of popped into my mind as you're speaking. That's yeah. Awesome. I like your style. That's uh that's capitalizing on any opportunity, uh, small or large as it, uh, as it comes your way. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, so, and, of course. and you know what, ultimately speaking as uh, if you're trying to, you know, pay your bills through, through music you've got to think like an entrepreneur and that's a a real entrepreneurial mindset is is recognizing opportunities and understanding what those opportunities could lead to potentially and then you know taking a step in that direction and i think regardless of what kind of business endeavor you're at you're after that those are the things you know you've got to you've got to stay aware of and conscious of uh, so a couple other things I wanted to to, uh, to brain pick you with here. Um, you, you mentioned uh, important social media uh, networks and whatnot. What's your stance and your approach to dealing with social, to Facebook, Twitter? I notice you're really uh, uh, active on Snapchat. I, I'm entertained thoroughly every day watching your Snapchat yeah. stories, so keep that coming. Usually, usually I'm just dancing like an idiot, but yeah. I find that Snap, Snapchat is pretty personal, right? Very. Like it's, People are like watching me on breakfast and like even when I go on and watch Lady Gaga and I see her wake up in the morning, she's petting her puppy. I feel like I'm laying in bed with Lady Gaga. You know? <laughs> it's very personal. So I find that that's like 
uh, that's a place where like people, it's like people are paying attention. Like, I don't know, there's a, a more of a connection there. Mm. Um, I used to be heavy on Twitter and I kind of moved my focus to Instagram. I can't do them all, you know, it just, it gets too much. Um, obviously Facebook because that's friends and family mostly. Um, I'm always throwing stuff out there and I'm sure people are annoyed and hate me by now. <laughs> but again, it's my due diligence as a partner of the bar or business that I'm going to be helping yeah. that I, that I put it on there, regardless if my friends are tired of seeing it or not, you know? Yeah. And oftentimes they aren't. Oftentimes they want to know where I'm going to be. You know, they can't always make it. I don't want to be like directly putting pressure on somebody to come. If I just throw it out there, hey, this is where I'm going to be this week on Facebook and maybe on an Instagram photo of my webpage screenshot or something. Um, I use those that way. If anybody ever reaches out to me on there, I'm always right on it. Mm, mm. I never let those hang. Um, but I'm not actively trying to like get followers anymore. I used to. Mm. I used to be like that. Um, I, I, if people are going to follow me there, I'm not going to be begging them to do it. If it's a robot, it doesn't matter anyways. Um, I do know that venues have told me before, they're very honest. They're like, listen, it's not a secret that we look at social numbers Sure. when we're, when we're booking bands here, especially at those places where you're playing your original stuff. Yeah. Because they, they want to know what kind of draw you have. Like I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, but like there's a lot of venues in the city, like very popular venues. I'm just going to throw three out there. Lee's Palace, the Opera House, the Horseshoe. Mm -hmm. If you want to play at those places, you got, and you're calling the booking agent there or someone who's booking there, they want to see that you have a, a decent following because that's a thousand person venue or more. You know, they yeah. can't have twelve people there. Yeah. So it does it does have weight in your booking one hundred percent. And you know, I got a fifteen hundred Twitter followers and seven hundred or six hundred Instagram followers and. You know, I don't have a lot on my Facebook page, maybe 500, mm -hmm. but, you know, that's just significant enough for what I do to say I have enough of a following. And it's mostly uh, geo-centric. Uh, yes. Like, most of my stuff I geo-tag for the city. Mm -hmm. I want people, I want the bar to know that I'm calling all of Richmond Hill, Ontario to that area. Right. You know, and, if I, and when I'm putting mm -hmm. shows out there, I'm not hashtagging Kevin Foster or come see me tonight, like all those silly hashtags that are sentences long. My hashtags are very um, driven towards getting people to see my posts who are going to see my posts. Like if it's in Peterborough, I'm doing five different Peterborough hashtags mm. and that's about it. And the bar, you know, right. And mentioning the bar. And then if that goes out on Twitter and it says Pete Bow and someone clicks on the PTBO, um, sorry, anybody else around the world. Peterborough, Ontario is a small city here in Ontario, Canada. Yeah. Um, and people click on that 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 hashtag, and my thing comes up, and they're looking for something to do. Then I'm there, you know. Yeah. Um, the the bars just appreciate that, and I just know that that's kind of a better way for me to draw to their bar, you know. So what about um, what about your when it comes to your original music and your uh, uh, efforts to grow a following and a fan base around uh, Kev D. Foster, the artist? Um, yeah. Are you using social media in a way that that's going to benefit those efforts as well? Yeah, I think more so. Um, so when I like, for instance, when I throw my list of shows out for the week, I will also at the bottom of the post say. Hey, also, I have a live record coming out in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I just put this new song out. Or, hey, I'm in the studio with blah, blah, blah. blah. So people kind of know what I'm doing. And I'll be honest with you, Des, even though I'm playing the Campfire Kev cover stuff, people oftentimes, I would say, let's just say one out of ten, are, are going to want to hear what I have, like my original stuff anyways. Yeah. I, sell, I sell a lot of original CDs at cover shows. Tons. Yeah. Tons. And like I, I sold my old band stuff for my early twenties. Two years ago, I sold hundreds of them, and it was like just I just brought a box set with me because people were like, "Do you have CDs? Do you have CDs?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I have some old CDs. I'm not very proud of. Really right. represent me, but like if you want to buy them, whatever you want to donate." And people were throwing me ten and twenty dollar bills for this music that that I didn't even you know I had no real personal relationship to anymore. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I, and then that's when I realized, like, no matter, like, I can't afford to put out a record. So another business uh, uh, endeavor I just made was I went and recorded a live record, just me sitting on a stool with a guitar, because that's what most people hear in the bar anyway. Sure. And most people want to, when they grab a CD from me, they've heard me in the bar singing, sitting on the dock of the bay, this, you know, 48-year-old woman who loves that song. She wants to hear me in my essence of that. So if I hand her a fully produced record, it's and it's got all my original stuff, and it sounds like what you know, it's kind of off the beaten path. But uh, it was very cost effective to do a live record. Mm -hmm. I did all my own original stuff. And I think it was also very important. And I, I invested quite a bit in getting good album artwork. Right. Because even those other CDs that I was selling, they didn't look very good either. Like this mm -hmm. artwork is very, very nice. Like even if you don't think you, there's uh, trickery that goes on there visually whether you like it or not spend some time on your album artwork make it relatable to not only your music but somebody else needs to visually connect with that in some way yeah don't make it some weird abstract thing that means nothing just like your music it has to be relatable so i think i think that was a big thing that i did so now i'm just getting these rest they were very low cost i think the overall investment is going to be a thousand dollars maybe $1,500 to have myself 1,000 CDs. That's recorded, mastered, pressed, wow. and everything. Yeah, that's excellent. So for $1,500, I have a potential $10,000 income, right? <laughs> yeah. We're talking tenfold. Like if it's 100 CDs at 10 bucks each. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it adds up. I mean? It's cumulative. You get going. <laughs> you start getting going in there, and you, and you start adding up more and more. So... I did a live record because it was f affordable and I can sling them at my campfire Kev shows. And when they take it home, they're getting a piece of Kev D. Foster, the artist. Yeah. So absolutely. it's kind of like I'm trying to do a crossover there. So the original question was, how are you building your fan base for my original music? Like I, I am building it doing cover music. Hmm. And do you think of bands like Pomplamoose? Pomplamoose built a whole career. They'll sell a million of their original songs now because they did cover songs for so long yeah, absolutely. that people are like, you know what? I'm going to buy this immediately. They have a million fans who are willing to pay for their music now. So, you know, maybe I have a thousand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because I've done covers. And, yeah. and, you know, little old lady loves sitting on Dock of the Bay. And this guy over here loved my, you know, that Skinner cover I did. Yeah. And they slowly, you know, then they were like, well, I want to listen to what this guy has to offer now. So I think it's a crossover, man. And I'm trying to find the balance. I don't know it yet. And there's no right answer. But uh, I'm trying to mix what I love to do in my original stuff with that stuff that kind of eats away at you sometimes. Yeah, uh, but, but pays but the bills. pays the bills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. No, that's really interesting to hear. And, you know, I just want to emphasize the point that, uh, that you discovered that that at these cover gigs, people oftentimes want to take a memento home. And I've had this conversation with a number of guests in the past, and, and it's... it's I really, you know, you hear the argument that, okay, you know, nobody buys CDs anymore, that that industry is dead. And well, of course, if you were in the business, if you were a record company in the business of selling records, certainly, yeah, business is not booming like it used to be. Yeah. That's an undeniable fact. However, right. a lot of times people will buy your CD or your t-shirt or your bald cap or whatever it is you have to offer more as a, as a, as a, a token, as a, as a method of support, guy. right? Yeah, I saw this guy or whatever. Yes. In, in fact, you probably have it too. I've got a couple of CDs mm -hmm. in the other the room right now that i've bought off of artists i saw that still have the shrink wrap on them all of mine <laughs> you know what i'm saying all of mine do. and i keep them wrapped on purpose and then buy it digitally yeah you know? absolutely and it is a memento it is a memento for me i have a box full of cds of bands that i play with just like that and you're on absolutely right and it's only the fact that i'm like you know what these guys are putting in their work i gotta give my 10 bucks right now yeah yeah that's it yeah, and so the the idea, the fact that you figured out a way to to get yourself a product, uh, a CD, without breaking the bank or without going into debt to do it, I think is uh, is clever, and 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 that's a point that should be highlighted. You know, you don't have to spend ten thousand dollars in the in the recording studio, uh, you know, to get yourself something to sell. You know, obviously, you and still I, want it to be of high quality, as high a quality as you're capable of. And like you mentioned, you spent the time on the artwork and the packaging, because a that's the first point of contact, the person grabs the disc, that's their first impression before they've had a chance to pop it in and hear it, right. So that's important. Yeah. It adds uh, uh, the, the quality to the presentation. And then you're good at what you do. So putting a mic in the room and recording live, I can imagine I haven't heard this album 
problem yet, but I could imagine sounds great because that's the way you sound when you're in the room in front of me. So I, I can't see it being any different. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that point that you don't have to be daddy Warbucks to get a product together and to have something to sell. And, uh, and also you can think of it in two ways as something to sell or as an opportunity for somebody to support you. You know, exactly. that's it. That is exactly. And that I never thought of it that way. And that's what I'm, that's the essence of what I'm trying to do is, but I'm giving them the opportunity to say, you know what, even though there's no tip cup here, cause I, I rarely put a tip cup out sometimes I should. Mm. Um, but you know, there's no tip cup here, but e- even if I was going to tip them, I'd like to take some home. Here's an extra tip, but I'm going to take that home. If they are going to leave me $5, now they're going to leave 10 and take a CD. Right. And I'm going to be honest. I don't put a price on my CDs. Mm. You'll make more. Interesting. You'll make more, money. You'll make more money. I used to say they were $5 or $10 or whatever. Now I say, pay what you think this is worth. And people will walk up and drop a $20 bill in there and take a CD. Interesting. Yep. I'm going to experiment with that. <laughs> Do that. Some people will leave. Listen, less people leave you a toonie than will leave you a 20. Mm. The respect, if they're already walking up to buy it from you, it's, uh, I don't, and I would be the same way. If I had a $5 bill and a $20 bill and they said, buy my CD, whatever you think it's worth, I'm a musician, so I understand and I know, but I would put the 20 down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. I wouldn't put the five down. If there was a, t- if it was $10 and I didn't have one, they lost out on $10. I would go back. Well, maybe I would go break my 20 and buy a $10 CD, but I would have left them 20. Right. That's interesting. I imagine there's a certain psychology at play there. Um, There's, well, for one, as you mentioned, if they've already come up to ask about your CD and how much it costs, um, they're they're already expressing buyer's intent. And if you say pay what it's worth, it's almost like um, uh, they nobody wants to insult you. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) That's fascinating. Put them on, put them on a spot. And that's what I say out loud. I and people ask me what I'm like, whatever you think music is worth, right? Whatever you think music is worth. And when it, when Des, when it's silent and the, and uh, you know, when you quit playing music at a bar, okay, before the bartender has time to put the house music on and it's dead silent Mm -hmm. and everybody can hear everybody else's conversations and they all kind of get a little quieter and the mood's kind of a little awkward. That's when people understand the value of music. Right. When there's silence, right? It's like, frick, this is awkward in here right now. You know, this is, this is, we need something going on yeah. or 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 a bride if you told a bride she could have no music at her wedding that's a terrible <laughs> wedding a terrible bar has no music a terrible wedding no music yeah. an elevator that's silent is very awkward silent yeah. elevators are terrible so the value of music is up to everybody and if you put it on them then that's up to them if they think that your cd's worth two dollars so be it that's one out of a hundred people that's going to do that. I guarantee you it will be way more because especially since you're pouring your heart out on stage, I never take a song off Des. I mm-hmm. never take a song off. Mm-hmm. Like as, as crappy of a mood as I'm in or as little people that are as in the bar, I'm pouring it out there. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, that energy means something no matter what. And, uh, and I think you get your value back in that. Yeah, absolutely. You know? 100% that's what I mean agree. So if you're pouring your heart out on stage and you say the CD is worth what you want and you're sweating and your voice is hoarse because you're giving it the top notch you can and your fingers are bleeding and, you, you, you know, they see that and they go, you know, what, this guy is giving her and he's working hard and here's a 20. Yeah. And that's that's what I and I think it's I made more money saying no price. Now, would you apply that approach to merch as well to a shirt or, a, or a, anything else like that? I think music is subjectively valued, whereas yeah. those kind of things are a little more objectively valued. Absolutely. Interesting. So, That's a good point. So when you're selling music, whatever you think it's worth is one thing. But when you're selling an actual object with objective value, it's a little tougher. You That's, know? Yeah, I, I'm I agree. Not gonna say, I'm not going to say yes or no, but I'm just saying like certain art is objectively, uh, certain art is subjectively valued. Right. You know, I, some people, some people will pay two thousand dollars for that piece of artwork that I, that's abstract that I don't really understand. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's subjective to them. They'll pay two grand for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now you make a good and point. So whereas you know, so I don't know. I'm not going to say yes or no. I just say that I just think that music, especially, 
is only valued at what someone thinks it's worth. Yeah. And that's my show too. That's my show too. So when, going back to the negotiation process, it's like if, if that bartender is lowballing me so low that it's not even near the ballpark, then I just understand off the bat that he just doesn't value music as what I think my value is. Mm -hmm. So we're just, we're not there. Yeah. You know, I understand that's cool. If you want a dollar fifty burger, go buy that. Yeah. Everybody and you know what? Sometimes everybody likes a dollar fifty burger. You know? <laughs> True enough. But but that's it. And if you can align yourself and just think of that as any other product. You are any other product or service. You know, if you are a plumber and you only have one bag of tools and you can only do a toilet sink, you're only worth much. Yeah. But if you can go in and you get the industrial stuff and you got giant pipe bars and you got all these cool tools and you're a professional and you got nice cars and your truck isn't rusting out, you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. look like you are worth that. Mm -hmm. Then you can char then you charge more. Your Absolutely. tools are more, your services are worth more. So just think about it as any trade and we are a trade. We're an artistic trade. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a business relationship. It's something I keep stressing over and over again in all kinds of conversations I've had because I think it's important to solidify that in the mind. It's not just so you're hoping that someone pays you to play. No, it's a business relationship. You have to yeah. bring value and in return, you'll get some value. And uh, yeah. that's uh, that's definitely a point that needs to be emphasized. Listen, man, I want to be respectful of your time. I've enjoyed this conversation. Um, my, my, uh, my butt's getting a little sore from sitting on this chair. I got to bring in my comfy chair at some point in time. I'll do that for the next conversation perhaps cool. but uh, cool. do you do you got a place where people can hear your music and maybe join your email list and stay in touch with you yeah so my email list and my uh music is all at kevdfoster.com so that's k-e-v-d as in david foster like the beer f-o-s-t-e-r.com and from there there's just very basic links so there's a tour and show link a music link and a contact link and if you click on the contact you can sign up for the mailing list um, all my social links are there as well and i just put two new singles out where i did break the bank mm. where i did pay you know well over a thousand dollars for one song mm. i did two of them there you go so if you relate that, I did two songs fully produced. It cost me over $2,000. I did eight songs live off the floor with the CDs pressed. Mm. I'm going to be at less than that. Okay. So a 10 song fully produced record for me to be at the level that I want it to be is a thousand bucks a song minimum. Yeah. So for 10 songs or eight or 10 songs, you're looking at eight or $10,000. That's hard to do. However, I'm going backwards. And this is one more point. I don't want to take too much time either, but I'm doing this live record as sort of a demo thing. All those songs are going to be produced over time. Right. And if you buy if you buy the live record, it's going to fund the production of the full record. And you're also going to see what happens from me on a guitar to what the full song, the arrangement that changes, the production value that changes, if the key changes, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So the song was written like this. You're getting the bare bones, the four chords and the truth. You purchased that. That helps me fund the full production and you get to see what comes of that. So you're kind of seeing the song grow rather than most people get a fully produced album then they go out and do a stripped down live version afterwards. Right. I flipped that backwards. So I flipped that backwards just in the mindset that it could fund the actual production. So if you want it, you like the song, you love the song, hold you that's on this live record. You want to hear that fully produced with a slide guitar and a piano player and backup harmonies and all that stuff buy this record and then i'll be able to go ahead and do that and you'll get another taste of that at a whole new level you know what i mean i i know exactly what you mean and i love it <laughs> it's it's uh, it's the whole sort of uh, a fan funding uh, mentality uh, combined with a very clever reverse engineering of your goals i think that's fantastic and i'm yeah. glad you i'm glad you threw that in because that's that's a that's yeah. a gold nugget right there <laughs> yeah listeners so pay also, attention <laughs> one other quick thing i did is i did those two songs out of my pocket I got all the receipts for them, and I'm applying for grants. Mm -hmm. So I did invest over two thousand dollars. I'm hoping that I can get that back, and maybe even more money. Saying, "Look, look at what I've done. I'm I'm willing to invest in my own artwork. What, would you be willing to invest in my artwork? And I can produce more of this. You right? Know what I mean, like and, Canada Arts uh, Council type of uh, grants, that kind of stuff. Yeah, Ontario Arts Council, Canada Arts Council, Factor. You, to be honest with you, probably every small town or municipality around here has a small arts council. Apply. Mm. If you're from, I bet you Durham has one. I know that York Region has one. They're everywhere. 
So I, and I, you know, I'm not a grant writer. I found a friend of mine who does write grants and I said, you know what, we can work a deal of whatever money you get for me, I will give you a percentage. Right. So write the grant well. And if you get us 10 grand, you get a good percentage of that. If you get us $1,500, you get, if you get a zero, a percentage of zero is zero. Right. So I don't mind paying them anything. A percentage of what they can get me, but I can't sit there writing grants all day. I'm playing too many shows and yeah. doing everything else, right? So that is just—I just want to throw that in there. That's where the business is going for me. I would like to—I would like to get some free money, sure, yeah. to record my stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, you know what I mean? Yeah, a hundred percent know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time. This was a good conversation. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. Um, Carol and I are working on a podcast as well called Fearless Creative, and maybe we can get you on, on, on that show to, uh, to, sh- to shoot the shite, so to speak, and maybe play some yeah. music with us or whatever. And uh, I'm, to. I'm looking forward to checking you out again uh, when you're in town because we don't make it too far afield, but uh, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing you play again. Is there something that when I edit this presentation, that I can play out with. You got a you got a YouTube video or a, or a track I can play out with. Video or just audio? Uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever you whatever you're proud yeah. of right now. Um, so two brand new singles on my web page. Um, I will I will send you them. Okay. I will email them to you. Um, one is called Heavy Hearts. One is called Shake Me. You can play it. You can pick whatever one you think is is more fitting for the show or for for the audience, and and just play a couple of one of my songs, one of my new singles. They they just got put out maybe a month or two ago on iTunes and Spotify and Amazon and all that digital stuff. I didn't press those ones, but they're the ones for the uh, that went in for the grant application. Very good. I will do that. I'll uh, I'll wait for you to send them to me. I'll tack them on the end before I upload this to the interwebs and hopefully people will enjoy what they hear and uh, head on over to kevdfoster.com and check them out. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. And we'll talk again soon. Cheers, man. Thank you. Hey, little lady, I see you crying out your big green eyes. I know I haven't made them smile for a while. Ain't no excuse for this. Not time.